So, Dr. Marvin Rappaport, welcome. Hi, John. It's always a pleasure to see you. So, we are in sunny Southern California with episode number two of our soon to be ongoing discussion about topical steroid withdrawal, red skin syndrome, and the other collateral uh, issues with all of that. Uh, may I? But mostly addiction to steroids. Addiction. Well, thank you, thank you again for the generous, generous application of your time. Just a couple of housekeeping things. I would like to remind everybody that's watching this to, to share, share these videos with your, your friends, your loved ones, uh, people you associate with, because it can, it can save you a lot of time in having to explain your condition, explain what you're going through, and just generally have, have to fend off I think these good natured suggestions of what could possibly be making you better or could make you better. You've heard it all, right? I think that's a superior subject to delve into right up front after our first interview. All of the wrong things that are done, all of the absolutely wrong advice given by various supposed gurus, all of the wrong medications, all of the wrong diagnoses, all of the wrong therapies, all of the wrong hospitalizations, all of the wrong scare techniques in an otherwise healthy, non-ill group of patients who are suffering badly from symptoms only. So I guess the first question I have, is chronic eczema a thing? Well, this is why you go to medical school and this is why you read the textbook five times and you examine patients endlessly into the wee hours of the night to get a coterie of human contact so you understand disease. The natural history of atopic dermatitis, also called eczema, that's associated with asthma and hay fever is inherited. The natural history of the rash is it burns out before puberty, invariably somewhere between three and eight, nine years of age. It stops. There is no such thing as bad eczema or chronic eczema. I mean, that's a, that's a, I mean, that's, that's a headline statement. I mean, that's a bombshell because we're seeing all these, these therapies that are being advertised for you know, finger quote, chronic eczema. You have to go back, not into the wee ages, the wee dark ages, but you have to just go back to the textbooks in the 60s and a little before that, or just at the onset of the use of steroids. The textbooks describe atopic dermatitis just the way I said it. It burns out. It never talks about adult eczema because they never saw that kind of patient. The typical story before steroids was that the kids scratched. Their hands were tied up so they wouldn't scratch themselves at night. They wouldn't make sores. And in the summertime, in the springtime, they were shipped outside to the sunshine and they all were cured. They all cleared, and the therapy was lubrication and antihistamines for itch, period. There was nothing else, and every child was cured. You, you just used the word sunshine. Uh, doesn't that just send many to the fainting couch talking about actually being in the sun? Well, we have a, a whole new litany of scare where a ray of sunshine will give you melanoma or give you a wrinkle, and it's believed outrageously, sun has been used since the dark ages as therapy for not only skin problems, but tuberculosis and for the well-being of arthritis patients, et cetera, et cetera. But in skin, many rashes were handled with sun therapy and the ultraviolet light boxes became uh, developed, I'm not sure when, but for sure the early 1900s, if not sooner, and as used as therapy in the wintertime. 
in most parts of the country where there is no sun all year long, not like here. So we talked about your application of steroids in our first interview, and I, I would like to reiter reiterate it. You are not against topical steroids. In fact, I looked at some of the replies to our first uh, interview. Uh, there was a, a lady who inquired, uh, how can you say good things about, in essence saying, how can you say good things about steroids when it's evil? I said, no, 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 it's a superb drug when it's used properly in the proper diagnosis, in the proper strength, in the proper length of time. It's a perfect drug. It's wonderful, in fact. So in the title, in the title of this episode of our discussion, we've got the word herpes in it. Have you, have you seen misdiagnoses of herpes in your career? Well, the, the problem lies in the misdiagnosis and misadventure into unusual ideas on the part of many physicians when they're seeing these people who are addicted to steroids. They've never seen bad eczema in their early careers. Um, they've seen addicted patients since the 50s and 60s. Uh, that puts into account almost all the doctors who are presently working. Um, the, um, the pattern of disease is itching in the folds of the skin, in the front of the uh, elbow, and behind the knees. Maybe some slobber dermatitis from food or salivation in the little kid infant. Maybe some generalized dryness and itching in the wintertime especially. No redness, no burning, no severe itching, just mild to moderate as evidence that this is another diagnosis. Entirely different pattern. And then on top of that, because this is a new diagnosis, it has other manifestations. The burning I mentioned, eczema kids never burn, they just itched. They get red uh, and they're blaming the sun for the redness on the face when indeed it's the steroids. Those other kids in a, who had eczema in the 30s never got red, rarely. They also are seeing little blisters that are caused by the steroids. The steroids works on the blood vessels of the skin, opens them up, fluid pours out on the inside causing swelling or edema, and it comes outside causing little blisters, especially on the face. And these doctors are calling that herpes, admitting them to the hospital scaring them that they're going to, it's a horrible disease. Well, yes, it was in the 20s and 30s. Patients died if they had herpes on top of eczema because the bed was a different bed of skin than the red skin people. The red skin people don't have allowance to have herpes alight or infect the superficial layer. Only the eczema people did in the 30s. I have not seen a case in 40 years. I've seen a case of what? Of herpes. They're calling it her, you know, uh, 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 herpes uh, eczema herpeticum. Uh, eczema herpeticum led to death most often. Uh, the herpes uh, virus went inside, went into the liver, into the brain, etc., etc. It was severe, very problematic. Admission, absolutely scared the hell out of every the doctors for sure i've never seen a case because it's not that diagnosis there's steroid blisters I, I and this is the reason we wanted to put that in the in the in the headline and so that would come up on the search algorithm so people who 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 could have this situation may delve a little deeper and and think about and do a little bit more inqu inquiries about what you're saying what is a path for someone who's well, let's let's ask this. Have you have you seen patients who have had a previous diagnosis of, diagnosis of herpes who are on the medication to 
suppress? Uh, yes. Um, mostly through the internet and mostly through telephone calls and some have come into the office after the fact. Um, in the days of eczema herpeticum, they were admitted to the hospital and they were in there for two, two weeks or more. We did not have good antiviral drugs at that time and they were supported. Now, many, uh, for some reason, England has a, a, a lot of cases. Uh, falsely diagnosed, uh, and I see it in America also. Now they're admitted to the hospital because of the fear from days of yore, and they're discharged within a day or two because they're so much better because they're they're blisters from the steroids, not herpes. This is outrageous. A, this is amazing news for someone who's wandering around, sure, living in fear of infecting others and and and, and being being sick with this, right? Well, and, and, and indeed, when I go back and ask them, I could be wrong. You know, maybe uh, there are cases out there that I have not seen or been privy to. So I inquire, tell me what happened. Did you have contact with anybody with herpes? Herpes isn't flying in the air and jumping on somebody's skin. You've got to be with somebody who had herpes simplex. Not, and not shingles, herpes simplex. They, they say no, they've never been with anybody. So where do they get it from? What is this herpes of the eye that I've heard of before? What, what is that? Well, there's a concern when it's on the face. We're not talking about shingles, which follows a nerve pattern. The, what you're citing, I'm suspicious, is shingles, herpes zoster, not herpes simplex where it affects the nerve on the face and is covers near the eye. I see. And there's a concern that it'll go into the eyeball. Good. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure that dialogue that we just had will, will generate some comments uh, down below. And that's a good thing because we'll touch upon them in our, in our third episode. Uh, speaking of third, you've, you've used the term third diagnosis. What does that mean? Um, we obviously are, okay. We obviously are seeing the vast majority of the addicted people chronically using steroids who have the underlying diagnosis of atopic dermatitis eczema. And they became addicted in infancy or early youth and it's perpetuated or reimagined by the body when they start putting steroids again in teen years or later because they're itching a little bit. Um, that's the first diagnosis, that's right? Number one. Okay. Eczema. That is patterned in the crooks of the arms, behind the knees. I described it. Different than red skin syndrome, which is the manifestations of steroid addiction redness all over, burning, severe itching, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and a different pattern altogether. And the third diagnosis, as they get better, they now look at other areas of their skin and they see the elephant-like thickening that, of their knuckles, of their wrists, of their ankles, of neck, uh, from chronic scratching. The scratch, scratch, scratch over the years thickens the skin, and I call that elephant skin, and they do too. And that will not go away, but with time uh, and sunshine. Now, does that elephant skin that continues to itch get re-diagnosed as eczema? Okay, I, good point, and I, I was going to, thanks for reminding me. Uh, so basically, I say that's the third diagnosis because if you talk to somebody on the internet or on the phone or from afar or they write to you, they're in their seventh year of still having problems. I said, well, l send me a photo. Tell me what you're talking about. And it's invariably the thickened elephant skin. And they still think they're in trouble. And that's why I say it's the third diagnosis that's really scar tissue, thickened skin from scratching, entirely non-active, entirely handled 
differently. So reiterate, to reiterate what you just said then, that third diagnosis will eventually go away with time and sun. Yeah. Is that Invariably, correct? all of the patients have totally normal skin, finally. But the acute red skin syndrome usually takes three to five years. And they still can have thickened skin in certain areas. They believe they still are in active role of, di of problems. And I'm saying, no, it's a remnant of the old, which will go away with time and sun. Well, one of the questions we had from our last session was, why for just spot usage of steroids, does the withdrawal in red skin happen to the entire body? Basically, like with all addictions, the bottom line starts spreading. So this addiction, a little bit of weak steroid is put on a few areas of the body. The recurrence allows or forces the patient or the, and the doctor to use more steroid. The next step, as it doesn't work anymore, is to use a stronger strength of steroid, which closes the blood vessels down even worse, and they rebound worse. The steroids are absorbed through the skin and goes elsewhere. They've been putting it on their arms and their face, elsewhere, and they start noticing itchies and hives and red spots on their legs. It's absorbed, and the same phenomenon is occurring throughout their skin. And so, they start treating that area, and it spreads the whole process. Well, then, so then that gets interesting, because yeah. that probably answers the second question with regard to tapering by body part. Can an addicted person say, okay, I'm just going to start with not putting it on my feet? Well... You know, the fun that I had and the angst or anguish was way back when I first started seeing these patients, I had to attempt certain therapies or certain patterns. I tried to taper the steroid use down. I tried to give oral steroid prednisone for a very short period of time to calm the skin down and then start tapering. I tried all kinds of lubricants. Nothing worked. It was the only way was absolute cold turkey. Absolute cessation totally of any and all steroids. And they flared and they had problems and I held their hand and then finally started calming down. You've used the term, which I, I find glorious, and that term is transformative suffering. Would you, would you expand on that a little bit? <laughs> I'm not sure I understand what transformative, but other than the patients go through absolute hell, fierce group of symptoms that is 24 seven operative, unreleased and unhelped by most medications, unhelped by medical care from MDs and PAs who don't understand and just think they have bad eczema and all they need is a stronger and bigger run of steroids orally by shots or by cream. And they are angry when the patient refuses because the patient thinks that maybe the therapy has been the culprit. You, you've talked about patients, though, that were using topical steroids habitually, but in addition to that, were altering their lifestyle because of their limitations, uh, where they went, what they did, walking, being... A... Could you expand upon that a little bit? It, the sadness. There was a book written a long time ago called Miss Lonely Hearts. A famous book that was made into a movie also. Basically, he was a uh, writer for a small newspaper in Jersey. And the letters written into him, moaning and groaning and sad and crying about the ordeals of their life, are typical of what these patients are going through. 
they'll write you, you say, let me hear what's going on, give me an idea of your symptoms, send me some photos. Their litany goes on page after page of how the ordeal is absolutely ruining their life. They are not living, they're just suffering all day and night long. Do they remember what it's like to not suffer? I tease because I know they're going to be cured in a gentle way. I make it light in a gentle way with the idea that you're going to be cured and you're going to forget me and you're going to forget every symptom you've ever had. That's what normal people do. And I'm usually pretty right on about that. <laughs> we have a we have a, a, a viewer that is asking about upper extremity lymphedema. What is that, first of all? Well, as, as cited a little bit ago, um, the steroids uh, dilate, uh, closes blood vessels down, and in response to that, which they're not used to, the vessels, they open up, and fluid starts pouring out. Well, it pours out inside, and in dependent positions, like the legs, if you have dermatitis and steroid applications on the legs, they're standing all day long. At the end of the day, they got puffy ankles and up to their knees sometimes. If they've been applying steroids to the face and the fluid pours out on the face, they go to sleep and they're lying down. They wake up in the morning with a swollen face. Scares the heck out of everybody. Um, and then the ooze happens. The little blisters happen. They start uh, pouring fluid outside. Um, problematic when misdiagnosed, but very benign and invariably ceases with the right therapy, uh, rather quickly. You, you also get reports of patients that have extreme difficulty sleeping and they may not be itching, they just can't sleep. What, what does that cost? Well, I, I inquire, um, so far I think the most common uh, thoughts that I receive from the patients is they're scratching at night, they're under the covers, they're hot, they get woken up by itch, and once they're up they can't go back to sleep because they're going to scratch themselves to end all itching until finally they can fall asleep. Um, the burning sometimes is a problem at night under the covers, and in general Many of them have to nap during the day because they're stuck with inability to function. So they have already used up their sleep time. Um, those are the reasons as best I can come up with. There isn't anything mental or going on in the brain stopping sleep or anything of that sort, as best I can tell. What? causes this extreme feeling of either hot or cold, profuse sweating and then followed up immediately or very soon after by chills? The red skin that occurs as in an area or areas or total body as a manifestation of the addiction and the dilatation or opening of the blood vessels allows for improper bark, like in a tree, protecting the body. They're not functioning, the skin's not doing its job, it's in, unable to do its job. So they don't handle temperature as well. They'll walk into a room and say they're freezing, they're chilly, uh, and you say, what are you talking about, the heat's on in, if you're accompanying them. Uh, or they'll go into a hot area and they're or they're cold, or they go into a, a, a cold area and they're warm. And it's all a matter of the skin returning to its appropriate uh, th uh, necessity to protect us, uh, protect our bodies. What is sebum? Well, sebum is a manifestation of oil production from the uh, sebaceous glands, um, most, manif most prominent and prevalent on the face, upper chest, um, 
and very involved with acne, uh, the sebaceous glands. Um, not especially involved here. The sweat glands are much more involved here in terms of shutting down, becoming paralyzed, and then opening up again. Sebum, I've not really seen any worries or problems. Sure, if they put a lot of steroids on their face and they're young enough, uh, they'll have the red skin, or all the other symptoms, but they could make acne because the steroids does affect the sebaceous glands. That's about all, nothing more. Than so, that. so moisturization application is really not required because the sebum is not being produced? Right. They're doing it because either they get some relief with moisturization, they have a tightening feeling because the skin is very dry, and they get relief from, with that, but it doesn't last very long. And they're always told to get the stronger one, the more expensive one, and false um, uh, advice on the internet uh, you know, allows for very expensive preparations that don't do much at all, at all. When we look at the business of dermatology today, it, it seems to be heavily influenced by, for lack of a better word, the, the cosmetic end of it, the cosmetic aspect of it, the staying young and beautiful forever. And then there are problems like this. Why are, why are you doing this? Why, are, why is this your thing? Number one, it was a challenge, a huge challenge. Number two, the patients were sent to me when I ran the special allergy clinic at UCLA with the hope, desire, and caveat that I solve the problem for them, referring doctors, that I find the hidden allergen or I find the hidden diagnosis, et cetera, et cetera. Do all the testing. The patients are in your hands because they were scratching their heads. They could not figure it out and the patients were getting worse. And then the relationship with the patient almost like the E.T. movie where E.T. holds his fingers out and the kid touches the fingers and there's an instant gratification uh, and friendship occurs. They're depending upon me. And I knew the answer after a while and I could cure them. What a power. So but there's I, no money in it. But you know how many people have been cured? How good it feels? Um, so much more than a stipend, so much more than how money is being made doing foolish testing of new drugs that don't work, so much more than shooting Botox. It's a pleasure. That's why you go into medicine. You better go into medicine for those reasons. It's a, it's a very heartfelt comment, and it's appreciated. I'd, I'd like to point out to the people that are, that are look, watching this, this, this is 100% your, your mission. This channel's not monetized. You won't see commercials on it. Uh, there's not a super chat donate line. We're not doing Patreon. We're not doing any of that stuff. This is a, this is a, a legitimate desire on your part to get this information out. It, it, I, I find it exciting, heartfelt, pleasurable, and whenever I get the thanks of the cure or I'm doing better or I'm living again and maybe a box of chocolate, I feel good. Um, and we'll get into with later discussions about the other groups who have tried to make money on this the groups who are giving advice and inappropriately, the places that are studying the patients as guinea pigs, plugging them into the new drug as per the drug company, who are making out like crazy, charging thirty, forty, sixty thousand dollars a year for drugs that are not working, et cetera, et cetera. I can't wait for those interviews. We'll, we'll have those discussions. I, I also would like to point out, I, I just find this interesting, it's from a personal note, 
this this dialogue that we're having today and the one that we had in in episode one, you, you and I never spoke about what we were going to be talking about during these interviews. I walked in with a piece of paper and some notes and didn't prepare you for anything. This is coming. Your responses are 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 are, are not the result of being forewarned what you're going to be hit with. Well, I, I that's sure remarkable. You, well, th- <laughs> thanks, but you, you you're a very good interviewer. I compliment you first, and you have been complimented in one of the replies. Um, you, you you'll drop a word, and that starts the whole process in my brain of what to discuss and what to talk about. All you need is one or two words, and I'm I'm off and running. Uh, I surely have talked about these things thousands of times with the patients. But usually, again, the fun that I have, each patient is different, each human being is different. So I have to approach them in a multifaceted way and I find the right way to get through to them to cure them. They need to be talked into sometimes, they need to be advised, they need to be kitzled, they need to be teased, they need to be shouted at every once in a while. I'm going to do anything that's necessary to cure them. And I find that very, very, very pleasing. Well, as a, as a favor for those suffering from dermatological issues, which we learned today can not necessarily be just attributed to eczema, I, I would like to ask our viewers to, to hit the like button hit the share button so that other people could benefit from this information. Again, it's not for profit. It's just to get the word out. It's just very important. And I'd like to, again, thank you for the very generous use of your time. I'd also, I'd also like to acknowledge that uh, the movie Skin on Fire, which is hyperlinked in the description, if you haven't seen it, uh, it it's great to look, look at. It's great to share with your loved ones just to explain the, the, the misery that people going through this are experiencing. And they're not sick. They're in a terrible state because of the medical care that they were given. I know that's a little um, gross, but it's the reality of what has been going on. Dr. Marvin Rappaport, that's wonderful. Do you have anything you'd like to add before we close? Well, we have many other subjects. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And well, it's look, a cliffhanger, right? Isn't that what the I'm show looking, was in the 50s? I'm looking forward to it. The yes. damsel in distress was hanging over the edge of the court? Or, no, under the, on the railroad track. Right, right that's now. right. <laughs> that goes back further. That, that goes back. You're too old to know. No, you're too young to know what, what that was all about. Well, we would like we would like to encourage questions and comments. We will respond to to as many as we can, and being repetitious is not a problem because sometimes hearing it more than once is what's required. Maybe one last suggestion, if possible, to the viewers who are interested in care. Maybe you got to talk to your doctors, not just your family and friends or those who are suffering. But see if you can twist an arm for them to open their eyes at the simplicity of this diagnosis and how to cure it. Well, that brings up another question. Uh, I I know we've gotten a couple of inquiries about uh, having you come speak at organizations. Is that something you're willing to do at this point? Well, I've done it. I've been lecturing to the dermatologist for the last 30 years at the academy, at various uh, other organizations that I'm involved with, at hospitals. I was invited in New York to one of the major hospitals in New York, et cetera, et cetera. Um, It just seems to fall upon deaf ears, and I'm surprised. Now, I cannot believe that I'm the only one. There are obviously doctors out there in the small towns, in the big cities, who are not writing papers, but just taking good care of their patients, who go along with this, and they see the results, and they're very happy. They don't call me to ask for more information. I hope they've read my papers. They don't thank me 
they don't uh, do anything with me at all. So, but I know they have to be out there. I can't be the only one in the whole world doing this. Well, this is gaining momentum. I mean, it's, it's abundantly clear that, that the topic of topical steroid addiction is gaining prominence. Well, as you it's, mentioned- It's undeniable. I'm sorry, in, in the, as you mentioned in the first uh, interview, that all of the drug company advertisements on TV include our medicine pill, our cream does not contain any steroids. So the word has gotten out and the producer of our movie, um, J uh, James Keach, was very pleased about that, that he feels that has made a huge inroad into the thinking of the drug companies. Well, that's right, because the other question would be, just in them saying that in the advertisement, steroid free, the casual viewer who's using topical steroids could say, well, my goodness, why would it need to be steroid free? And that opens the door to the entire conversation. Well, and again, and I don't mean it to be mean spirited, but the reality is it's very easy for the docs to talk about withdrawal. I've got nothing to do with that. I'm going to help them with withdrawal. I know that they refuse to use the word addiction, which they induced and they propagated and promulgated for a very long period of time. We would not need withdrawal if we were not addicted. You know, it sounds so dark, but just knowing that is amazingly good news. It's liberating news to people who are suffering from this. They're all gonna be cured. All they need is good direction, a doctor who cares about them, who supports them. And I use minimal drug, lots of hand-holding, and I use a huge amount of cyclosporin in the most severe problem patients who are not functioning. The drug works like magic. Uh, none of the new drugs have shown any, any value at all in my hands. Dr. Marvin Rappaport, thank you for your time, and we'll be doing this again very soon.